Hi, everyone. My name is Tim Quinlan. I'm a technical marketing manager at Coder. Uh, you've probably seen me up at the booth if you were walking around on the floor. Um, one of my favorite things to do is to go out to different shows and meet people and talk to them and promote our software. So that's what I'm doing. That's why I'm here. So let's start with the old uh, raising hands section. Uh, so raise your, have you heard of Backstage or are you using Backstage? Cool. It'll keep your hands up if you're raising. Have you heard of Coder or are you using Coder? All right. You've heard of Coder. Come on. Um, how about Dev Containers? Anybody, okay. Keep your hands up if you've answered yes to any of them. All right. What about if you really just want to stop troubleshooting your developer environments? Yeah. All right. There we go. So we all have something in common at least, uh, or at least we all have some sort of interest in this. So um, as I was just talking uh, with this guy up front, uh, Coder, the company, we've been around since 2017. We're 100% open source developer tools. Even our paid for stuff is open source. Um, the way it's licensed under the AGPL does give us a few protections there uh, so we can actually make some money. Uh, but um, yeah, we, we live and breathe open source. We currently have 185 repos on our GitHub instance. Most of them are you know, are revolving around Coder, which is our flagship pro project, um, or you know, just open source development tools in general. And our goal as a company is to build an ecosystem around cloud development environments. <clears throat> so some of the projects that we have up there, Coder obviously is our flagship um, project. That is a cloud development environment that sort of encompasses everything. If you've come to our booth and asked me what Coder is, I'd give, I've given you the spiel. Uh, we'll go a little bit more into it in, in this, this talk. Code Server is another is, is our most popular project. That's the one that most people know about when I mention it. It's VS Code in a web browser. It's been around since 2019. A lot of other projects use it. I have people at shows come up to me all the time and say like, hey, you know, we use Code Server and this and that and the other thing. Uh, a guy from BeagleBoard stopped by the booth yesterday and they actually have Code Server running on the board the, it, the, itself. So if you need to develop software on for that architecture, you just log into the board with Code Server. It sounds really cool. Uh, Code Marketplace is another good one. If you're running if you're running at an air gapped uh, like an air gapped DC, you can use Code Marketplace to host all your extensions and things like that. That's a good one. Envbox is nice. We have a registry of 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 modules to enable common IDEs. That's really cool. And then the bottom stage, or, or the bottom line, are, are, uh, are plugins that we have. We have um, a plugin for all the JetBrains IDEs to use Coder with it, one for VS Code, and then the backstage plugin, which is what I'm going to talk about today. So we also do need to make money every once in a while, and this is the only slide I have about that, uh, and then we'll get back to the open source stuff. But we, we do have paid features that uh, allow you to scale and, and, and manage a Coder instance. Uh, a lot easier once you get up over about 50 or 100 users. So uh, if, you, if you are a coder user and you, you think you might scale up to that level someday, uh, give, give one of us a ping at the booth and, and we'll talk about those for sure. All right, back to the open source stuff. So Backstage and Coder, why are we talking about both of them? Number one, I, I just have to tell you that I am in no way affiliated with Backstage Project at all. Um, simply here representing Coder because Coder has a plugin for Backstage. So if you're a Backstage user, I can guarantee you that you know more about Backstage than I do. But uh, I'm here to talk about the, the dev tool side of it. So Backstage is, you know, it's a framework for, if you're not familiar, it's, it's a framework for building platforms, right? And Coder is a platform for online development or cloud development. So they dovetail really nicely together. So what is Backstage? This is a pretty basic service catalog that you see. Uh, Backstage has a lot of different things. Like I said, it's, it's a framework for building developer porters, portals. It has this service catalog. The cool thing about the service catalog is there's a lot of data about the services that you're using, like who owns it, what are the SLAs, what's the status of the CI, things like that are all included there. The project scaffolder, which we'll talk about in detail in uh, the next slide, that's a really makes it really easy to import projects into Backstage and do things like use the Coder plugin. Uh, and we'll, we'll take an in-depth look at that during uh, the slides and the demo. API documentation, always handy. Um, 
it's nice to have one source of truth for, for all your APIs. Uh, service quality and status, we already discussed that a little bit. The dependency overview is really nice because you can look at your uh, look at your different services and see, hey, you know, it depends on this, depends on that. So it's good for troubleshooting and for architecture work as well. And then there's also a plugin ecosystem. Um, Backstage, it's basically all React. So if you can write React, you can write plugins for Backstage. So and that that's the way ours is developed as well. So the scaffolder, this is the way that you create new. Uh, new things in Backstage, or new apps in Backstage to catalog and, and to uh, deploy out to your developers. Um, it's it's if it's pre-populated, that's great. You you can put all your you know all the all the projects you want in there. Um, but we're going to look at how to do it from scratch with um, just a couple of YAML files and a Git repo, and then use Coder to develop it. So essentially, uh, when you do the scaffolder. Um, you know, you you just you give it a name, you give it a description, and um, you know, there you go. It's pretty it's pretty straightforward. Uh, but like I said, we'll look into it a little bit in detail. So, what makes what makes a good backstage deployment? All right, like I said, this this is stuff that we've kind of gathered just from, you know, looking at the industry, uh, a couple of of customers that are using backstage, and um, just looking into the community. And, and like a lot of platforms, it starts with a with a small focused team that, that is core to the to the mission that you're trying to achieve. You know, people who really believe in it, people who are going to try to um, use it for everything that they can. Another thing that makes a good backstage deployment is important services are cataloged in it. It's not just a bunch of edge cases or stuff that's maybe not actively maintained or Whatever you get the idea. When you when you have your when you have your core functions in the catalog, um, you know it, it's going to draw a lot more usage and it's going to you know basically have a little bit more cred, I guess. Uh, plugins are added uh, as needed. I.e., you don't have the the backstage team saying, "Well, here's the ten plugins we're going to give you, and that's it." You know, your your developers are coming to you and saying, "Hey, we need this plugin, that plugin." Um, you know, this is what we need to do our job. So it's sort of an organic design after it's deployed, and that your developers are using it every day. Uh, we had um, one customer of ours who's a backstage user. They said that they were using, they had 2,000 devs using it for 40 minutes a day. We're in backstage 40 minutes a day. So that that's a really good adoption rate. Um, you know, backstage isn't something that they're in and out of constantly. Rather, they're, you know, they're going in, they're setting up their tasks for the day, and then they're running from there. So what makes a great backstage deployment? Once again, with, a lot, with, with platforms that you're creating, uh, leadership has to get it for it to be truly great. If the leadership doesn't buy into it, then it's going to be really tough to grow it and to scale it. Um, metrics are collected and analyzed and, and taken seriously. That's another big thing. Uh, you know, if we have, we could collect every metric in the world, but if nothing's ever acted on, you know, why bother? Uh, the the self service uh, true self service provisioning that means that the the devs can go into the catalog and literally just with a few clicks be up and running and that's kind of where Coder comes into this and we'll see that in the demo uh, coming up and then the developers are able to contribute it with inner source or has anybody heard this term before inner source yeah it, it's a relatively new term I just heard it a few weeks ago. Um, where it's basically like open source, but inside an organization, right? You could have a, de a developer on project A say, oh, I like this thing they're doing over here on project B, but I need to tweak it to make it work for me. So here's a PR, right? And here's the way we can both use it. Uh, very similar to open source. Uh, you, you know, you can scratch your own itches or you can take somebody else's scratching stick and adapt it to, uh, to your itch. So the stages of a backstage deployment, once again, very standard platform stuff. Uh, you install it and customize it, tweak it, get a get a uh, an M, like a minimal, minimally viable product. Something that you know you could give to a small pilot group, and they could start developing on or start working on right away. Then catalog the status quo, right? That's what when I mentioned like important things are are 
are registered in your backstage. You know, it's not just a bunch of the edge cases. So, you know, these are your main services. These are the things that your business is running on, right? You, you, you can use Backstage as a main source of truth for those. And then finally, it's, it's really a dev toolbox, right? It's, it's a way to, to get the developers what they need when they need it. Um, there are a few gaps in what Backstage does where when you look at the complete um, SDLC or, or just stuff that, that developers are doing every day and, like I said, Coder dovetails and, and fills those, those pieces in really nicely. So as I mentioned before, it's a framework, not a platform. This is actually a, a screenshot of American Express's Backstage. Um, they're a really big uh, Backstage user, um, really involved in the community. Uh, it's called Runway, I guess, for a airline thingy. I don't know. <laughs> but um, they're, uh, they, were, they were really helpful with, with our engineering team in getting this, this plug-in going. So, yeah. There, so I, I guess you know we include this slide just to show that it's not just uh, little random places that that are using it. We have big, 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 big companies using it, and Backstage itself, if you're not aware, it, it is a CNCF project, so it's it's got some good backing. So, um, like I said, it's React. So if you can write React, you can write Backstage plugins, and uh, you can you can uh, build pretty much whatever you need at that point. Uh, this is this is just an example of the plugins uh, registry that you can do. Um, you know, just like everything else, uh, every extension registry out there, or app registry out there, or, or app store, whatever you want to call it, uh, you can put everything in a, in a nice centralized uh, environment to choose. You can let your devs choose from all these. So we're talking about things that developers do, and uh, we we surveyed. It was a couple of hundred developers from our customers about wh where are you spending your time, right? So th the way you can read this chart is th none of these are going to add up to 100%. This is an average answer of where uh, SWE said they were spending their time. So planning code, writing, testing, deploying, operating production, maintaining code, developing their or, uh, dev tools config, and then uh, security and compliance. So you can see, obviously, the, the biggest thing that these devs are doing is writing code, right? Makes perfect sense. Um, and one of the other things that they're doing that's taking up a considerable amount of their time. No, that wasn't me. I don't know what, what was going on there. Maybe a loose wire, thank you. Um, another thing that, that they're spending a considerable amount of time on is DevTools config. Um, and these are two things that Backstage doesn't really do, right? You can see that Backstage, they have everything except those two categories pretty well covered. Uh, you know, it's great for planning, right? You can, you, can use, um, you can use the scaffolder to get an opinionated, pre-configured environment that you can go and just sort of hack and crack and, and add and tweak to your needs and, and away you go. Uh, the testing is there, de deployment, operating, maintaining. And then compliance as well. I mean, Backstage is great for compliance because it's like a one source of truth for everything. But it's, it's really missing those two fairly large categories of writing code and, and, dev, uh, and dev tools config. And that's where Coder comes in. Uh, there's a little bit of overlap here with maintaining code and compliance. Um, Coder is nice from a compliance standpoint because you can always, if an auditor says, hey, what, how was this built, right? What version of some random library was installed on the machine when you compiled it, right? Uh, that stuff, those are questions Coder can answer for sure. But uh, the DevTools config is, is Coder's big thing, right? It's a way to get, it's a way to get um, DevTools in a pre-configured manner out to your users in a consistent manner. <clears throat> and then writing code, obviously. Uh, Coder enables the IDEs that your developers want to use. Excuse me. Whether they want to use their own local ID or a web-based ID, Coder can handle that. Coder is really cool for um, for kind of quick hits on on projects too. Like if you have somebody who's coming in and say you have a contractor who's coming in for a month or something, you don't want to spend two weeks setting up their developer environment. You, know, you want them to be able to get in there and, and code right away. So you can use uh, Coder with like a web-based ID and get them in perfectly. So yeah. Um, we, we did a, a CD adoption report, and then um, also JetBrains 
uh, mentioned this as well in their um, uh, developer ecosystem paper, but developers are spending you know, 40 to 60% of their day in their editor. Right? So they, they don't want to be configuring dev tools. They don't want to be doing uh, audits. They want to be coding. Right? So how do we get them to code fast? How do we get them to that point? So coder. Let's do a time check here. So as I mentioned, it's an open source platform uh, for deploying and developer environments to people. Uh, faster onboarding, most, our, I think our average customer reports 10 days saved initially for onboarding a user with coder versus the old fashioned way. Um, also, your devs aren't maintaining their environments, their dev environments, so that's you know a couple hours a month per dev that you save. The environments are consistent. As I mentioned, everything's, everything's template. Everything's from a template, so everything's the same. You can audit, you can go back to see what was installed, uh, who did what, um, and uh, everything's, everything's very cookie cutter across the board, which is what you want. It elim I know it's, it's, it's an old phrase, but it works on my machine, right? It, it, it really eliminates it works on my machine because there is no machine anymore. Uh, everything runs in a cloud instance. And then uh, it's a great way, if you're worried about like source code and data leakage, uh, something like Coder is great because the source code never lands on the, on the developer's workstation. It, it all stays in the cloud instance. And it's self-hosted too, so you are in charge of, of where that data lives and how it's stored. There's no SaaS, there's nothing like that to worry about. So I talk about the, the idea of templates. We use Terraform as a templating language. So if you can do it with Terraform, you can do it with Coder. Um, you know, you can do one pod per developer, one VM per developer, or you could do multiples. It doesn't matter. You know, you could have one pod with, you know, running an older version of your software and another pod with a newer version, and you could have them running side by side. You could do, you could try changes on them. Um, you could have as many, as many workspaces as you want, um, or as many pods or VMs as you want, uh, depending on what your admins let you get. Of course, there's quotas and things like that that they can set. But um, there, there is no, I guess, there is no magic solution. There is no silver bullet where coder would say, do it this way, do it that way, only have one pod or only do one thing per workspace or whatever. It, it, it's, you, you, it's up to you to figure it out. We're not going to prescribe that. Um, and then everything the dev needs can be pre-installed, right? That's the whole idea. Either you bake it, in, you bake it into the image that you're using. Uh, I just use Dockerfile here, for example. I mean, we, we support VMs as well, so it would be on a VM in, image. Or you can do some runtime configuration with some scripting that we'll take a look at. When, uh, when the pod comes up, there's some scripting that you can add to add, you know, do some final configs, things like install, you know, install their extensions, grab their dot .files from Git, things like that. So workspaces, we talked about, we have, we have the template, which defines what the workspace is, and we have the workspaces, which, which are created from the templates. And uh, they're, they're individual environments, right, for each developer in each project. Like I said, if, if a developer's on six projects, that developer could have six workspaces, one for each project. If, if one workspace would cover all six, he, you know, they can do that. But typically, you know, you can do as many as you want. And it's zero config needed on the developer side. Like they don't even have to install an IDE. They log in a coder, and they can run VS Code in a browser, and away they go. Or they can SSH into it, or whatever. Um, they don't have to have an IDE installed locally. And the workspaces also will is one one thing we'll, we'll get into. Our dev we, we do support dev containers, and uh, that's a th that's a third way to get software installed. Uh, who's who said they're familiar with dev containers? I know you guys did. Steve, yeah. okay, yeah. So for the, the you guys who aren't familiar with dev containers, basically it just it fires up like a really generic container, then grabs another Docker file, and then builds builds that Docker file and overlays it onto itself. So it allows the devs to bring their own dependencies, or to define what they look like, I guess, or define what the containers are going to look like. Um, it's not something you want to do for everything. Like you don't want to give your most junior devs that power, but. Uh, <laughs> We're not talking about junior devs. They're going to be, you know, these are going to be your 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 best guys. So, and this is, you know, kind of what Coder looks like. You can see that uh, there's a web UI. You can open a local VS Code connection, or you can get uh, one in a browser. This is just a local one. And if you look, I don't know if you guys can see it. Why? I don't know why it's doing that. 
It only, it, whenever I look over there, it comes on. Has, have there been a lot of graphics missing? Oh, OK. So if, if it looks weird, just be like, and I'll look over, and it'll fix itself. Um, anyway, I don't know if you can read this or not, but you can see that this was, if you look at the icons, you can obviously tell this was done on a Mac. But uh, when you're in your, when you're in your uh, local VS code, you're actually connected remotely to the, to the workspace. And you can see that it's actually running Linux. So it's not, that, it's not like we just tricked anybody in that screenshot. I don't know. I don't know why you would. So we talked about backstage, what makes a good uh, backstage deployment, what makes a great backstage deployment. Same thing with Coder, right? Very similar things. They're both, you know, they're, 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 one's a way to make platforms, and the other one is a platform. So a good coder deployment, you're going to start with that small focus team. Um, your, your common use templates, that's the same as, 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 as getting your important services cataloged with, um, with Backstage. So what you want to do is you, you want to have a template that gets most of the tools that most of the devs need and then specialize from there, right? Like I said, there's, there is no one way for us to tell you you should have 10 templates, or you should have one, or whatever. It's, it's up to you. But if you can get like that sort of middle 80% of the bell curve with, with one template, that, that's a really good start. And then you can have different templates for your edge cases. Or you could take those templates and fork them um, if there's enough of a difference. And then it works for new and existing projects. Like a, a, real, a, a good coder deployment, you should be able to take your existing dev tools and get them, um, get them deployed with coder. So what makes a great deployment? Once again, leadership gets it. Leadership buys in. Leadership sees the value of it. Uh, it can, if it's integrated with, with your golden path, right, of like, hey, here's the perfect way to, to deploy software in our, in our company. Um, you can use Coder. Uh, that'll get you everything you need. You, know, you don't have to bother with wikis. You don't have to bother with, um, with configuration. You go in a couple of clicks, and you're ready to commit. And then teams, finally, the, 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 thing, the last part of making a great deployment is that teams can bring their own dependencies. That's where dev containers come in. Right? You can have a, a, a principal or a staff level person on one team, and they just give them a dev container, and they can, they can set it up however they want. They write the Docker file. They check that Docker file right in with the code. So the next time somebody starts up that workspace, it's going to be exactly as the developer wants. <coughs> So stages of a coder deployment, sandboxes. Most coder deployments start with 10 users. Um, and they start with our open source. And um, a lot of people are happy with that. Like I said, if it's under 50 users, we just say use open source. We don't even bother with the commercial stuff. Um, once you get into using different teams, though, um, that's when it gets a little tough to manage with just the open source stuff. And uh, some of the enterprise features are helpful there. But I mean, you can get around, you can get around with the open source as well. So you go from sandboxes to teams, then to bring your own tools, right? And like I said, dev containers are a big, big thing for bring your own tools. So let's take a look at what it looks like in real life. Um, how much time do I have? Just 45 or I don't even know. So, uh, so we talked about templates. This, this is a template that I wrote that it, it's pretty straightforward. We, get, we give you base templates to start with for each, or for any uh, compute environment, we can give you a template. Uh, so I just started here with my Kubernetes template. This is all boilerplate except for one part. Um, and it's this startup, it's this startup script. Remember I said there's things that can happen at runtime with, with scripting. So what this, this image starts, it has the back ends for IntelliJ and for PyCharm uh, already baked in. So what this, all this script does is when this pod starts up, it looks to see if those back ends are there. And if they're there, it starts them and registers them, with, re registers them with the agent so you can connect to them remotely. Then when a user logs on to Coder, this is all they see out of that, right? They see. Uh, VS Code Desktop, that's built in. You can, you can shut that off, but that's kind of built in by standard. Uh, code Server, actually, Code Server was in. Code Server was in the startup script here. That comes in every startup script. Uh, you can remove it if you want. It's, but I left it there. There's also a terminal there that they can go in. And this isn't like a great terminal that you can work in all day long. What this is, this is for if there's troubleshooting and you're on the phone with a dev, and and rather than saying, hey, here's the 
kubectl exec command, like they can just grab that terminal and get in and go. But this is it. This is all they see. So whenever they open their whenever they open their IDE, this is this will be our web-based uh, VS code. It looks just like real VS code. You can get a terminal on it. Um, you know, do whatever you're doing. Uh, it's fine. And the same goes for uh, VS Code Desktop. You can see it opens up my, my normal VS Code, and you can see it's doing an SSH connection back to there. So here I am in my normal VS Code. And if you look, if you look in the extensions, or you look at the sidebar for the extensions, you can see there's a different set of extensions here than there is in my main VS Code window. That's because this VS Code configuration is living in the workspace. Right? If I do a uname here, you can see that I'm on a Linux box or well, pod. So it's all remote. Uh, I lost my place. Where am I? Um, so yeah, that, I mean, that's Coder in a nutshell. You create the template. Users come in. They start it. It's, it's that simple. It's one of those things that's so elegant that it's, it's almost hard to demo sometimes because it's like, what you know, it doesn't look like much, but it's great. So for Backstage, uh, we have we have a couple of different plugins. I'm echoing really bad all of a sudden. Um, we have a couple of different plugins. Uh, the backstage pl plugin coder. What that will do is connect you to a coder instance, to a coder template. That's the one we're going to look at. There's also a dev containers backend that will allow you to directly start a dev container on your machine. We're not going to talk about that in the demo, but we we can show you that later uh, on the floor if you want. Um, but the, the example I am going to use in Coder will use a dev container. So it's kind of confusing. Anyway, Backstage uh, has this, when you're using the scaffolder, basically all you do is you, you have this catalog.info or catalog info YAML file in your project. And that tells Backstage basically what to do with, with, where, you know, with, with the code that you're doing. Uh, this one has some Coder metadata in it. It tells it which template to use and a couple other parameters, but um, it's pretty straightforward. And then this, this project also has a dev container in it. So if you're, if you're not familiar with dev containers, uh, basically you just put a .dev container folder in your, in your repo, and you have the Docker file that gets built. You can see this one's really simple, but it's there. It's a Docker file, right? And then there's a, a, JSON, um, a JSON file in here that defines it a little bit further as well. So you can see that um, there's a, a couple of things that happen, but it's, it's, nothing, it's nothing crazy, right? So what we need is we need the URL for this catalog.info YAML, or catalog-info YAML, sorry. <clears throat> and we also need to start we need to start backstage. Now, this is this uh, super basic local instance of Backstage that I have running. Um, it's not customized. It's not really doing much of anything. But you can see it's there. Uh, all it has is the example. There, there's nothing going in there now. So if we do a, if we do a create, um, remember I showed you that catalog, right? This is basically a, a, a standard catalog. It only comes with one, uh, one service available. Uh, we could use that, or we could do register existing component, right? So this is how you you pull those existing projects in, right? With that, um, with the uh, the file that I just showed. So what we do is we paste that, we paste the URL to the catalog info .yaml in. <clears throat> it says, okay, the component is Python project. We know that it knows, you know, which GitHub it's in, and we import it, and then we view it. So now you can see that. From this part, or from this point, in a normal in a normal backstage deployment, you would have like your your docs and things like that. But there's nothing in there to allow the the person to code. Right? With Coder, I'm already logged in and connected over to my Coder instance, uh, but I don't have a workspace yet for this. But with the plugin, once again, this is kind of boring to demo because I'm just going to click on this one thing and it'll jump over to Coder. It'll grab the template I need. And it'll start up a workspace. Now you can see that this is all Terraform code that's running. Uh, this is nothing, nothing earth shattering. Uh, but you'll see in a second where it'll pull that, um, it'll pull that Docker file down out of the dev container spec, and uh, 
and it'll, it'll start building that, and then it'll bring that up, and everything we need to develop that project will be in there. So there we go. It's, 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 kicked, off, um, it's kicked off the build for the dev container. You can see it cloned the repo that has the dev container in it, and it's building the image. Now, this can take a minute um, because it is building an image over top of an existing uh, container, but this will get cached. If you do it enough times, it'll get cached. So. <clears throat> so while this is building, are there any questions? I have t-shirts for questions, <laughs> by the way. You can see it's doing, um, in our, in our uh, Docker file, we had a couple of packages that were, uh, Flask packages that were getting installed. You can see they're getting installed now. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. Oh, wait. Mike. Yeah. There you go. Thanks. Is there somewhere that you deal with affinity so that the developer who comes back to that cache of, of instances is likely to come back and touch the same instance they were using before? Yes. And then, like, how long do you keep them running before you recycle them? Um, yeah. Yes, to your first, to your first question. Um, oh, what size T-shirt do you wear? Oh, you already got one? Cool. So, yes, um, and we'll see when we, when, we, when we go back and look at it. It'll already be there. Um, and as far as re, like recycling, um, that's really up to the, to the developer. Um, you can, even in the open source version, you can, you can leave the instances running, or the, the workspaces running indefinitely, uh, but you can shut them down when they're idle, but they'll still be there. Uh, we use a, a persistent volume for the home directory, so even when the instance goes down, when it comes back up, it just overlay mounts the, the home directory so their files are still there. With our enterprise version, we have a concept of dormancy where you can set thresholds that will actually delete the resources um, and, and completely get rid of them. But when you're talking Kubernetes, having a workspace stopped really is not that big of a deal at all because all it is is however, however, much, however big that persistent volume is. That's all it is at that point, right? You know, it's not like you're storing a 10 gigabyte image or something. It's, it's just their home directory. So anyway, now if, if we connect in here, we'll, we'll do the, um, the web-based uh, web VS Code. You can see that that project's already there. It's already, it's already cloned. It's ready to go. And from this point, you, know, you, could, you could go in, change your apps. You could get a terminal, rerun it, whatever. Um, like I said, there's not much to demo, right? <laughs> because it's it's pretty elegant. But as far as uh, will will this continue on? Yes, yes, it will. Like if you if you log out and you um, and you come back in, you'll you'll see that your workspace is there and running. If your workspace, let's just um, let's just stop this workspace for now. Whoops. You'll see it's immediately in an offline state, right? But if you click on it, it'll fire it back up. So, although I might have just broken something by doing it twice. Oh no! Oh, it just connected back. It's still stopping. It just connected back to that page. And even if you if you trash the um, if you trash the backstage project and then recreate it with all the same parameters, it, the, it'll still have the same association. So, did that answer your question or? So yeah, that, that's the demo in a nutshell. Like I said, it's pretty straightforward stuff. Um, it doesn't look like much on the surface, but um, that's the beauty of it, right? There, there, there isn't much on the surface. Uh, and for a developer who really just wants to be writing code, that is, uh, that's, that's what they want. That's what they want to see. So like I mentioned, these are two different technologies. One's a, one's a, a, a a way to create developer platforms, and the other one is a, a developer platform for cloud uh, development environments. And they have different things, but uh, or, or different um, uh, high points, but they all kind of dovetail nicely together. And um, you know, we feel that that Coder and, and the Coder plugin uh, it, it fills the, the gaps in, in Backstage in perfectly, and, and the two made up really well to cover the entire SDLC. Uh, and then. They have a lot of common things, or a lot of things in common between what makes a good 
deployment and what makes a great deployment. You know, self-service is one of them. Dev containers take care of that. A golden path is is uh, is key. That comes from that leadership buy-in. When leadership can say, "Here is the way," you know, this is the way, right? Like the Mandalorian. Um, uh, security. They 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 both. Uh, they both have some uh, security advantages, Coder especially. Like I said, the, the, you can configure it so the source code never lands on the developer's desktop. Um, you don't have to worry about their laptop getting walking away or anything like that. And then there's obviously uh, productivity gains for each. Um, with Coder, you know, you're, you're eliminating all of that configuration and maintenance of the of the development environments, um, and that's just an ongoing savings on top of. That you can. There's also some hardware savings as well. I mean, now you don't have to give people, you know, seven thousand dollar laptops anymore because they could just use anything with a Chrome browser to connect and, and develop. Um, you can also reduce your cloud spend too. Like if if you're developing now on static VMs that are just up running twenty four seven, you can definitely uh, definitely make some some or definitely see some savings by using something like Coder. So that's it. Oh yeah, sorry. The, the roadmap for the plugin. Um, this plugin is still pretty young, so we are looking for uh, you know we're looking for PRs, we're looking for feedback, we're looking for issues. Why is it not? I don't know why it's doing this. I can see it on my screen. Maybe I don't know. Is it? It's not like the video. The video is not like. It's just the presentation mode. Weird. Um, so yeah, it's 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 still in active development. It was only released about a month and a half ago, so um, it's still pretty new. Um, so we're always looking for for uh, for feedback and um, and issues. You you can go uh, onto Coder onto Coder's um, GitHub and, and see all the docs there and, and raise issues and do PRs if you want, um, or you can hit me up and I can pass those on to product. So. That's it. You can, here's all the links and everything. I think if you if you scan that QR code, I think it just has all these links if you want. Um, or you can come see us at the booth and we can give them to you. So that's it. Uh, the next, I still have about five minutes. Do we have any questions or? I have t-shirts. T-shirts. Was that a, a question in the back? All right, here. Can you use the mic? Uh oh, yeah, like hang on, hang on, so you get that. I think they're recording these. So, so I, I'm working the very interesting field, gaming. Oh, and neat. then I see a lot of customers actually looking at backstage and also tools like Coder. So nice. do you see um, potentially uh, plugins built specifically you know, for gaming, let's say when it comes to Handling things like matchmaking, um, player progression. Do you do you see actually these type of toolings evolve toward that direction? So it's more a broad question. Um, you know, I I, I think it, it's flexible enough that you could apply it to anything. So yes, uh, is is there is there a direct movement right now? I don't know, um, but I don't see why there why there couldn't be. Uh, Coder is extremely flexible. We have a bunch of different use cases that, that folks are using it for. Um, you know, I don't see why developing for a game couldn't be couldn't be done. I mean, as long as you can, as long as you can get that tooling installed into the workspace, you should be fine. I mean, we support every OS too, so we're not. It's not just Linux. I mean, you can develop with with Windows or Mac as well. So, if you were developing like a um, uh, you know for Windows for a game. I mean, obviously, you're not going to be developing like super heavy duty 3D graphics on it or anything like that. But you know, for all the, the sort of like the networking and, and things like that, yeah, you know, the, the sort of non-graphic intensive stuff. So to follow up on the, the application, yeah. I want to follow up on what you just said about uh, graphics. So there is a, mm -hmm. I, I met a couple of companies building um, what they call cloud acceleration for gaming. Uh -huh. You can see it as a cloud-enabled game engine okay. where some of the services are actually spread, uh, broken into microservices. So things like rendering, physics, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, I'm, and you're, I'm just asking a broad question. You know, I'm 
trying to see if it would make sense. So do you think you know you can apply a similar approach actually for an industry like that where Absolutely. there is graphics? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, Yeah, I you know I don't I, like I said I don't know about graphics. We we only have one really graphically intensive customer. They do like they make drones that are automated or something. I don't know. Sorry, I keep walking in front of that speaker. Um, and they use um, they use No Machine for their accelerated graphics, and it works pretty well. It works well enough for them. I don't know if it would work well enough to develop a video game. However. Uh, as far as having all the microservices and everything running, you could very easily create a workspace um, that instead of deploying a pod, it just deploys a new namespace, and then all the pods in that namespace have all the, have all the, um, the serv microservices that you need, and then you could set up the DNS in that namespace to look like you know, real, the real world, right? So, yeah. The, the cool thing about Coder is it's Terraform, and if you can do it with Terraform, you can do it with Coder. So. The, the use cases that we have that we de we demo on the floor are pretty tame compared to what some folks are doing. So, any other questions or no? Okay, cool. Well, I have thirty seconds left. I think I'll I'll cut it at that. Oh wait, one more question. Yeah, question. Maybe oh. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I was partially distracted, so maybe you covered that. Okay. Uh, do you have any like static analysis tool integrations with, uh, with Coder, or is there any plans for doing that in the IDE level? Um, I mean, if, if, if you can install it into your IDE, you could install it into any IDE that's running in Coder. Um, I'm, not I'm not sure I totally follow your question. Is, is this more of a tooling enablement? Like yes. within the, yeah. Yes. So it's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if, if, you can, if you can enable it in your IDE now, you can do the same thing in Coder. Uh, so like if there's extensions or things that you need to install, what you do is when you bring Code Server up, you just install those extensions um, at, at the command line with that startup scripting that I showed, and they'll be there and ready to go when you, uh, when you open it up. So. Oh, thanks, Marco. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah. Uh, you might want to move away from the mic or from the speaker. Some, uh, idle curiosity. I'm not sure if it's right. Oh, okay. I don't care. Go ahead. Okay. If it starts squeaking, move away. Yeah. There just, just out of idle curiosity, what's it been like seeing Terraform change its license? How that is? How that, has that affected Coder's strategy? Seeing it move to a less open approach. Um, we're marked safe. <laughs> <laughs> by that, and by that I mean um, Mitchell Hashimoto is one of our advisors, so um, he's cool with us. Uh, but we're we're not we're not affected. We wouldn't have been affected by it anyway because we're not in a direct direct competition with them. Uh, we do support Open Tofu, so if you want to use that, you can. Um, but we're still defaulting to Terraform and will be for the for the foreseeable future. So. But yeah. It, I can see why they did it. 